Γεια σας. Ευχαριστώ για την πρόσκληση. Thank you very much for the invitation and I'm really happy to be here again. Uh, I'll discuss with you a little bit my experience with the degenerative AC joint, when to operate and how to do it or how I usually do it. AC joint uh, arthritis is quite common and a lot of patients will come to your clinic. About 5% of the Americans come with an AC joint problem. So this is a large number of patients and uh, we don't really expect to operate on all of them. This might create a big, big issue. Etiology. This is a joint that can have arthritis like all the other joints in the human body. But also because it's a small joint, it takes a lot of load and it's susceptible to injury because it's really superficial and it takes a lot of load, two things. So the usual three reasons to have arthritis is uh, primary osteoarthritis like every other joint or rheumatoid arthritis, post-traumatic or dysoclavical osteolysis in overhead workers or usually bodybuilders. For the diagnosis, you usually can easily rely on your clinical examination. So the tenderness and the paxinose test uh, together with uh, cross-body adduction, acromioclavicular resistance and O'Brien will give you more than 93% of accuracy in the clinic. And those tests together are here in the next picture. So on the top left, you see tenderness at the AC joint. Paxinose is when you press on the clavicle and you get pain right at the AC joint. And then resisted O'Brien together with the adduction and uh, uh, resisted abduction gives you 93% of, of confidence that this is an AC joint problem. Or you have that plus other issues that you need to address. Injection in the area is a very good test and can also be used as a treatment. What I usually do is I use the local anesthetic and that steroid because this could be the first step for diagnosis and a possible treatment for the patients. Imaging uh, will show the usual uh, signs of uh, arthritis. The ultrasound is useful because you can use the probe and while you uh, are over the AC joint, you can press. And if the patient uh, is painful, then you know you're actually pressing the AC joint and the AC joint is causing pain. And it can also be used for an injection if you want to be 100% accurate. Even though injecting around the AC joint doesn't have significantly different or worse results. But conservative treatment might fail or the mainstay that is usually conservative may not work, and then we need to consider other options. So how long do we wait? Usually three to six months with appropriate analgesia, injections and physiotherapy. If the patient continues to be painful and the tests continue to be uh, positive, then we need to consider surgical treatment. Arthroscopic or open, uh, in the long term, it is reported that they have equal results, but the truth is that the arthroscopy gives us the advantage of checking the rest of the joint, that's extremely important. And in the short term, uh, arthroscopy has a faster return and re recovery. Uh, but irrespective of whether we do the AC joint open or arthroscopy, we have to check the axial joint inside because there's a large number of uh, concomitant injuries. Calf tears up to 81%, uh, labral tears 33%, or uh, other tendon abnormalities 22%. So you have to uh, examine the rest of the joint if you operate on someone with an AC joint problem. It's rarely just the AC joint. Usually these are either patients that had a, a car accident and the seat belt pulled on their clavicle and it resulted with a disc problem or uh, heavyweight uh, lifters or bodybuilders with osteolysis. These are the two cases where it's usually isolated AC joint pathology. So what do you do? You need to identify the AC joint. That's the first step. Starting from the bursal side, I do this uh, with the standard three arthroscopic portals. I do not use any specific or different or anything else. So you view from the back, you go from the side, use the one to go and I find the AC joint and then you push on the clavicle on the bottom right and you will see the clavicle pushing... Uh... <laughs> I'm here now. <laughs> it was a long drive though. <laughs> so uh, if you push on the clavicle, you will see it moving. And that's extremely important because sometimes, and I have seen that happen, people can be misled and start chopping the middle of the clavicle. And this can create big, big, big problems in the x-ray afterwards and how you explain this. So once you know you're in the clavicle, 
then the next step is to dissect your AC joint. So you need to dissect it from the lateral and then from the anterior portal. I don't do a second portal. If I've already worked inside the joint from anteriorly, then I use the same portal. I just shift the skin a little bit higher and then the joint from the front. Otherwise, you just put a needle and you go in from anterior like you would do an anterior portal. And you dissect your AC joint, avoiding the posterior and superior capsule. So all you're allowed to do is take the anterior and inferior capsule, and then you're safe not to create instability. And then the next step is to resect the axial AC joint. So you always start from anterior, moving to posterior, and then try to go from superior to inferior. And in the last view, you can see the, the capsule at the top. You must always protect the superior capsule and the posterior capsule. These are your two uh, restraints against instability, and they're extremely important, equally as important as the ligaments, which you avoid by uh, adjusting the length of resection. Once you've resected the AC joint, or the distal clavicle, then your next step will be to remove the acromion lip and a little bit of the acromion. So all of these will give you adequate resection and allow for impingement-free range of movement. Oh, sorry, let's go back. Good. Inside the AC joint, there's always remnants of the disc. So the fluffy stuff is disc. The shiny stuff is capsule. The disc contains a lot of uh, proprioception and pain fiber. So it's good if you can clean the capsule from the remnants of the disc to reduce the pain uh, sensory fibers. But you must be very careful. It's best to leave some disc than to violate the superior capsule. And then you control your dissection length. And I'll go into that in a minute. There are two bleeding tips. So when you do this, you may get bleeding, especially if the pump pressure is uh, low. So you always need to increase your pump pressure and reduce the outflow of your saver. But if you do get bleeding like on the left, it's always coming from the bottom corner, bottom and left corner on this. So if you use your wand, you can go blindly and ablate at that corner and it usually stops all the bleeding. If you get bleeding from the actual bone, then again, you can use the wand in the cutting mode, the yellow button, and again, you can stop the bleeding coming through the bone. This sometimes happens when the block is not fully working or if uh, the anesthesis uh, is uh, outside of theaters. <laughs> so the next important thing is the length. There are lots of papers on how much you should resect or how much you should not resect, depending on where the ligaments attach. The original paper is by Boehm. It gives us about 1.8 uh, centimeters, one centimeter for male, to resect safely. Then Betzel 2012 says five uh, millimeters is even more safer. But here it states the importance of the superior and posterior capsules. Those two must always remain no matter how much of clavicle you resect. How do you gauge how much you resect? It's good to know your instruments. I usually use my wand and I try to take from the entire joint, not just the clavicle, about two widths of the wand. This gives him 7.5 millimeters, which is safe and usually does not violate the ligaments. Always, though, be careful if you have a very tiny patient, you may need to resect less. And uh, you, depending on what tool you use to measure, so if you use a five millimeter bear, it's about one and a half widths of that. If you use a helica to measure, then it's about two widths of a helica. Depending on what tool or instrument you use, that's, that will give you the width because you cannot accurately measure it any other way. And because of the parallax of the scope, you need to align it with both sides to make sure that they're flat. It looks like it, it's an opening mouth, but actually my tool is uh, flat and it goes flat against the two surfaces that I've resected. Complications. Basmania collected all the complications after an AC joint excision, and the most important one is instability. And the best way to protect yourself from instability is following all the steps we talked before. Now, there are a few more questions. Should we always resect the AC joint because we're there? 
if we do a calf repair and the patient has no symptoms at all, then there's no need to do anything to the AC joint. You're there to deal with a different pathology, so you deal with the actual problem, and this has been uh, investigated and there's a clear answer to that. Now, what happens if there is pain and there is AC joint pathology and you do a calf repair? Do you always have to address the AC joint? Now, that is a big question. Park and Al did a prospective randomized trial and found that in his hands, it did not make a difference. Then Wang published the report and Core Insights used the same report to say that you should always be very cautious. You don't always have to resect the AC joint. This would go more into patient per patient base. And if there are other significant pathologies you're addressing, you may need to uh, leave the AC joint depending on, as I said, this is a case-by-case case, uh, scenario. Thank you for your attention. This is Canterbury. <laughs> Thank you.